And everybody said, I welcome everyone tonight to our leadership development session. I pray that the Lord will develop every one of us in Jesus' name. And in particular, I want you to notice the approach we take in the leadership meeting because it's to develop us. If you are a teacher, it's to develop your teaching ministry. If you are a pastor, it's to make you a better pastor. If you are an evangelist, it's to watch and see when we minister like an evangelist. And if you are going higher and other areas of the ministry is being emphasized in your life, is to notice that this is the way we minister so that when you are ministering as an evangelist, you will not be acting like a teacher, like a pastor. Everything will show that we are being developed. In particular, in the passages we are looking at today, Psalm 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, and 106. Before you teach, you should read all those Psalms and notice something like a string. What goes on in all the verses, all the chapters, that then will help you to do justice to the whole passage. So please pay attention. I know you always do. I'm just telling you to do what you have always done in a better way. And the Lord will bless everyone in Jesus' name. The Amen of the Psalms. Father, we thank you today and bless your name. Thank you for your servants. Thank you for our brothers, our sisters. Thank you because in every area you have raised up leaders. And I pray, Lord, you develop all our brothers, all our sisters to match the calling you are giving them in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to the Psalms, and tonight we're talking about our call and commission to serve the Lord. Our call and commission to serve the Lord. Please underline that word, serve. And as we go through the Psalms, look for that word, serve. We're looking at Psalm 101, reading from verse 1. It says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Look at verse 2. It says in verse 2, serve, underline that, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Look at Psalm 101, verse 6. In Psalm 101, verse 6, mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, here is the word, he shall serve me. Look at Psalm 102, reading from verse 21, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. That's the service. We're declaring the praise of the Lord in Zion. And then in verse 22, when the people are gathered to together and the kingdoms here is the word again to serve the lord we're coming to psalm 103 and verse 20 in psalm 103 verse 20 it tells us bless the lord ye his angels that excel in strength that do his commandment hearkening unto the voice of his word and then in verse 21 he tells us bless ye the lord all ye his host ye ministers of his that do his pleasure what do the ministers of god do they do the, the pleasure of the lord and they serve the lord and then in verse 22 he tells us bless the lord all his works in all places of his dominion 
bless the Lord, O my soul. Looking at Psalm 104, we're looking at verse 4. Who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers. Those are the ministers that serve. They serve the Lord and he makes them a flame of fire. Psalm 105, I'm reading from verse 17. It says, a saint, a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold as a servant. And then he came and he served the whole of Egypt and served all the nations around. And then in verse 22, in verse 22, to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach, that's the service, that's the service that he rendered, and teach his senators wisdom. And then he tells us in verse 26, he says, he sent Moses a servant. That's Moses that served the Lord and served the children of Israel. He sent Moses his servant and Aaron whom he had chosen. We're coming to Psalm 106 and we're reading from verse 3. It says, Blessed, blessed are they that keep judgment and he that doeth righteousness at all times. If we're going to serve the Lord, and if we're going to serve in the church, there must be righteousness, practical righteousness, and continuous righteousness all the time. It says that doeth the righteousness at all times. And then in Bastachi, it tells us in Bastachi, Still talking about verse 23, thank you. We're looking at verse 23. Therefore, he said that he would destroy them, and not Moses is chosen as Jude before him is served as an intercessor in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. Look at verse 30 now. In verse 30, then stood up Phinehas and executed judgment. So that the plague was stayed. That's how Phineas has served the nation of Israel. In verse 31, it says, And that was counted unto him for righteousness unto all generations forevermore. And the final verse in verse 48, it says, Blessed, blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting and let all the people say Amen. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. As we have gone through all those verses in all those chapters, you will see the emphasis of serving the Lord. And how appropriate for you and for me as we come to this leadership development that we will see all the various areas, all the various angles revealed in all these psalms on how to serve the Lord. Serve Him acceptably and serve Him profitably and serve Him righteously and serve Him with focus to please the Lord in all things and at all times and serve him in a way that your service will be rewardable. I pray that you will reward you on the final day in Jesus' name. There are three things we're looking at. Number one is the calling and character of ministers who serve the Lord. The Lord has to call us and he calls us into service and then we have to have the appropriate accompanying character as we serve the Lord. Number two, the consecration and consistency. Consecration is not just, uh, you know, I was consecrated uh, 20 years ago. I remember my zeal and my passion and my commitment and the absolute surrender. But now I let down. There must be consistency with that consecration. The consecration and consistency of messengers who serve the Lord. Number three, the conscience and the conscientiousness. The conscience and the seriousness, the conscience and the zeal of models who served the Lord. In the passage we're looking at, he gave us model and he gave us a Joseph and he gave us Moses and he gave us Phineas. They are models of servants of the Lord and we follow their conscience conscientiousness as they served the Lord. Let's look at number one. 
Number one, the calling and character of ministers who serve the Lord. You are going to notice something here. Point one, Psalm 100 and Psalm 101. Point two, Psalm 102 and Psalm 103. Point three, Psalm 104, 105, and 106, so that there is consistency. As you look at the Word of God, we're not just saying what we're saying without reference to the Bible and without anchor on the Bible. Look at this now. We're looking at the calling and the character of ministers who serve the Lord in Psalm 100, verse 2 serve the Lord with gladness come before his presence with singing and then in verse 3 it tells us know ye that the Lord he is God it is he that has made us and not we ourselves we are his people and the sheep of his pasture look at Psalm 101 verse 6 it says mine eyes shall be upon the faithful in the land. We need workers. My eyes will be upon the faithful of the land. We need to get more territory and we go, need to go to the regions beyond and we're not just going to gather every day can hurry. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land. That they may dwell with me like jesus christ chose the twelve that they will be with him and then he'll send them forth to go and evangelize that they may be with me he that walketh in a perfect way he shall serve me that's it we need qualification for service and we need the character and the lifestyle and the behavior of the people who are going to serve the Lord. There are three things we're looking at here. Number one, the commandment to minister and to serve the Lord. Number two, the character of ministers and servants of the Lord. Number three, the cost of mercenaries in service for the Lord. Look at number one. Number one is the command to minister and serve the Lord. Psalm 100 verse 2. It says serve the Lord with gladness. That's a command. It's not giving us an option. You're a child of God. You are born again. Okay, if you want to serve the Lord, all right. If you don't want to serve the Lord, all right. No, it's not all right. There is a commandment and it says serve the Lord. And then it tells us how to serve the Lord with gladness. Not that somebody is pushing me. Somebody is, you know, saying uh, you must do it. After all, you know the Bible. After all, you've been coming to church for a long time. Why will you not do it? It says, come with your heart and offer your service to the Lord cheerfully and gladly and happily. You are rejoicing while you are doing it. Come before his presence we're singing. Look at verse 3. It says in verse 3 here, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. That's why you serve him. You see how great he is. You see how high he is. And you see how holy he is. And because you know his attributes, and you know his character, and you know his majesty, and you know his exaltation, because of that, you know that, and that affects your service. It is he that has made us without him there's no existence without him there's no life and so if he has given me the life if he has given me the skill if he has given me the ability everything belongs to him and then i give it back to him he made us and not we ourselves we are his people and the sheep of his pasture and look at deuteronomy chapter 10 we're reading from verse 12 we're following after the command he has given and the command is serve the Lord look at this it says and know Israel what does the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God respect him honor him reverence him hold him in high esteem and then to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God serve the Lord thy God 
with all thy heart. There's no reservation. You are not holding anything back. I can't give God this time now. I'll use that for myself. I can't give God this talent now. I'll use that for myself. I can't give God this skill now. I'll use that for myself. It says to serve the Lord without any reservation, with all thy heart and with all thy soul. And then it says in verse 13, in verse 13 it says to keep the commandment of the Lord and his statutes which I command thee this day for thy good. When we do it, it is for our good. It tells us in Luke chapter 4, reading from verse 8, the very words of Jesus when Satan was uh, tempting him uh, and was saying uh, that uh, Christ should bow down to him so he can give him uh, the kingdoms of this world. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, look at this, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only, and him only, and him only shalt thou serve. The kind of service you give to the Lord, you give him a special kind of service. You give him a kind of service that is exceptional. And you give him a service beyond any service you can give any organization in the world. And him only shall thou serve. That's the commandment to minister to serve the Lord. Number two now is number two. We're looking at this, the character and of ministers and servants of the Lord, the character. Now, we know that the work of God demands a lot of workers, but that doesn't mean that we just really cop everybody, whether they are saved or not, or to keep them in the church, whether they are sanctified or not, we just put them there, or we see the tendency that, you know, some people, they are running to places where they'll make them pastor or make them bishop, and we say, deep alive, what are we doing? Our people are running to this and that and they're looking for position let's do the same no we cannot do the same because there is the expectation of the quality of life that a worker ought to have and so we have the character of ministers and servants of the Lord I want you to look at Psalm 101 verse 2 it says I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way here is somebody who already is having a position in the kingdom of God God said I have found David that will fulfill all my pleasure he was already king and it was there nobody competing with him and yet he knew for me to remain in favor with god i will behave myself wisely in a perfect way oh, when will thou come unto me i will walk within my house with a perfect heart you seen the word perfect for the second time. Look at verse 3. It says in verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. He was king. He had the liberty. He had the authority. Nobody was looking over his shoulder. But he said all the same. God watches everything. He sees everything that I'm after. And because of that, I will search no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Look at verse 4. It tells us in verse 4, it says, If forward heart shall depart from me, I will not know, I will not recognize, I will not approve of a wicked person. Uh, if you're a real leader, a real pastor, a real overseer, you're not looking at talents. 
you're not looking at skill. First of all, you're looking at Christian experience. And you're looking at the life that is plain, at the life that is honest, at the life that is transparent. You're not saying, well, we know he's, uh, you know, backsliding. We know he's not living right. We know he doesn't possess personal holiness in his relationship with people we know he's quite diplomatic and deceptive we know he doesn't have the life of the christian but you know he's a talented man she's a talented woman you're not looking at that you're looking at the character of ministers and servants of the lord a forward heart shall depart from me i will not know or recognize or put in place a wicked person look at verse 5 in verse 5 who so privily privately slandereth his neighbor him will i cut off him will i take away uproot from that area of work him that has an high look and a proud heart will i not suffer will i not permit you see character becomes comes before charisma the behavior comes before the ability and then it says in verse 6 it says mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land he himself at pledge he was going to be faithful he himself had pledged he was going to walk in a perfect way and because he himself was walking and living privately publicly in a perfect way he now said they that may that they may dwell with me he that walketh in a perfect way he shall serve me and you cannot just uh, say i'm a leader that one is uh, not good you remove him and you yourself you are not even as good you're careless you're indisciplined and you're not behaving as a real pastor as a real leader ought to behave in the language of your mouth in the action of your heart and in your behavior generally people know that this is who you are but you carry the position and you carry the power and then you have the liberty to remove somebody and then to discipline somebody and yet you yourself you are not walking in a perfect way the psalmist the king the shepherd of israel the leader first of all said i will bring discipline into my life I will live the way I ought to live. And then after that, if anybody is not living according to the standard of the word of God, I will have the responsibility of removing them and counseling them and helping them to shape up and to live and to walk in a perfect way. I pray the Lord will make us faithful to his word in Jesus' name. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Let a man so account of us as of ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And then in verse 2, it says, Moreover, it is required, it is demanded. This is compulsory. It still was that a man be found faithful. He doesn't know you are coming and then you just bump into him unexpectedly you find him faithful he didn't know you are coming to the family and you just knock at the door and you are not hearing arguments while you are outside you just come in like that and you find them faithful he didn't know you will attend their reception after their child had gotten married and then you just come in there unexpectedly and you find them faithful faithful to what we're all teaching and faithful to what he himself has taught in first timothy chapter 3 we're reading from verse 1 first timothy chapter 3 verse 1 it says this is the true saying if a man desire the office of a bishop 
he desireth a good work in verse 2 here is a character a bishop then a pastor then an overseer then a leader then must be blameless the husband of one wife vigilant sober not frivolous not careless not a jester you know if, if somebody is telling you something you look it's not only the word it says you look at the gesticulations you look at the seriousness you look at his personality it is the personality that gives weight to what he is saying and therefore he says a bishop that wants to talk to sinners so that they will repent and have conviction and get to heaven a person that wants to talk to members of the church so that they will count the word of god serious and go on their knees and pray and make their their lives right with God, they ought to have the conduct, the character, the disposition of being sober and serious of good behavior. Give me to hospitality apt to teach and then he says in verse 3 it says in verse 3 not giving to wine no striker not greedy or feel the looker uh, you you know somebody is talking to you and he says he's a pastor and you can perceive the odor of beer the odor of alcohol and then maybe you sum up courage you don't expect this maybe my nose my uh, you know smelling faculty is deceiving me and then you say my brother do you take alcohol he says why are you asking we're saved by grace and the grace of god covers everything you need to answer the question do you drink alcohol or beer are oh, you asking me are you my judge the way he's dodging the question means he's doing that and he is ashamed of that he cannot confirm that he's doing it he says if you're going to be a leader you are no striker and then you are not giving to wine you are not greedy or filthy looker but patient persevering not a brawler and not covetous in verse 4 it tells us one that ruleth well his house his house is quiet his house is peaceful his house is orderly the members of the family they have respect for him because they see his steadfastness his stability and his sanctified life having children his children is subjection with all gravity then he says in verse 5 for if a man know not how to rule his own house if a man cannot keep his wife living with him if a man cannot keep the children under control and the children are still teenagers they're under his roof but he can he does not know how to rule his house how shall he take care of the church of God? And then he tells us in verse 6, he says, not a novice. Not a novice. Somebody who just got born again, doesn't have experience in life. And then he's saying, other churches are making people like us pastors. Other churches are making uh, some of our people like us workers. What's deeper life doing? If deeper life does not change and give us position and all these old, old people, they refer to people like me, all these old, old people, they just sit tight there. When they say, going to be our turn, not a novice somebody who has experience in the world experience in life experience in the grace of god experience in leading the church of god to christian experiences and to real stamina and standing and steadfastness in the word of the lord those are the people that are leaders not in novice less being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil 
for and then he tells us in verse 7 it says moreover he must have a good report of them which are without lest they fall into the reproach and the snare of the devil i pray god will help us to maintain the standard every time whatever other denominations and churches whatever they are doing in jesus name that amen is low amen. number three now we're coming to number three and in the cost of mercenaries in service for the lord what's that mercenaries the people who are there for what they can get the people who are there for the remuneration the people who are there for what they gain from serving mercenaries what's the cost great cost you remember a can it cost the children of israel 36 lives they went to battle not knowing that a can was there they call a great cause and then judas iscariot you will remember judas iscariot when as he was uh, one of the workers that jesus christ had chosen and yet secretly he had more connection and more contact and more attachment with them with the enemies of christ than with christ you remember jeroboam jeroboam was the one that god gave 10 kingdoms to and then he said so that these people will not go and worship in jerusalem and their mind and their heart will turn over to the house of david because of that he said look at your gods O israel and then he searched up idols for them in best and idols for them in Dan. The Lord is telling us it's a great cause when we put people who do not have conversion, they do not have the character, they do not have the consecration, they do not have the consistency, and we just put them in the place to serve and to work. It's a great cause to the kingdom of God. We're coming to Psalm 101, verse 7. It says, He that walketh deceit shall not dwell within my house he that telleth lies shall not tarry in my presence in verse 8 it says i will early destroy i will early remove i will early extract take away the wicked of the land from the land and that i may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. If uh, David was saying he'll cut off all those wicked doers from the city of the Lord, how about the church? Why do we leave a backslider is taking care of that? Why do we leave a slanderer is taking care of that? Why do we leave a liar, a perpetual liar that even does not blink an eye when telling lies? Why do we leave them in the service of the Lord? David said, I will cut them off from the house and from the city of the Lord. They shouldn't be people who are preaching repentance to people when they have not repented. They shouldn't be people who are preaching holiness without which no man shall see the Lord to other people when they themselves do not possess that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. We ought to be vigilant. Malachi chapter 2, we're reading from verse 8. Malachi chapter 2, we're reading from verse 8. But ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. What's the consequence? Look at verse 12. In verse 12, it then tells us that the Lord will cut off the man. The Lord will cut off the person that doeth this, the master and the scholar, and out of the tabernacles of Jacob and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts when they do not keep the heart, 
the holiness, the purity, the sanctification, and the behavior of a called and commissioned minister. It tells us in Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 7, Galatians chapter 5 verse 7, ye did run well, who did hinder you? That ye should not obey the truth. Paul the apostle had taught them, and then there were other people that came in Judea and they confused the Galatians. And look at what he's saying in verse 8. It says in but say this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. And now in verse 9, he says, A little leaven leadness the whole lamb. And then what's the consequence of that? Look at verse 12. In verse 12, I would that they were even they were cut off which trouble you they trouble you with false doctrine they trouble you with a licentious life liberty you can do whatever you you want to do you are saved by grace it doesn't matter your lifestyle paul the apostle said they'll be cut off we're coming to point number two now point number two is the consecration and consistency of messengers who serve the Lord. What kind of consecration do we ought to have? And what kind of consistency do we ought to have? We're looking at Psalm 102, reading from verse 21. Psalm 102, we're looking at verse 21 to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. And then in verse 22, it says, when the people are gathered together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord. Those who are serving the Lord. Now Psalm 103, we're looking at verse 20. It says in Psalm 103, verse 20, bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength and do his commandments hearkening unto the voice of his word in verse 21 he says bless ye the lord all ye all ye his host ye ministers of his that do his pleasure if we are ministers of the lord we do his pleasure not our pleasure and we do his will not our will and in verse 22 it tells us it says bless the lord all his works he has recreated us he has remolded us we are his workmanship all his works in all places of his dominion bless the lord O my soul, as we look at the consecration and the consistency of messengers who serve the Lord, there are three things we're looking at. Number one, consistent messengers who declare his prophecy. Consistent messengers who declare his prophecy. Number two, consecrated ministers who do his pleasure consecrated ministers who do his pleasure number three confined mouths who deliver his precepts look at number one number one consistent messengers who declare his prophecy we're looking at psalm 103 verse 20 it says bless the lord ye his angels that excel in strength that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. He gives us the angels and the messengers of the Lord, and he sends them from heaven, and he sends them to different people, and they do not say, no, I can't do that. Go to the one that is to be the mother of uh, Samson. I can't do that. Go to Gideon, who doesn't have any confidence in himself. And he's saying, where are the miracles that her father shows? No, I can't do that. Go to Daniel and show him the things to come, the prophecy concerning the people of Israel. No, I won't. Go to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. Or go to Mary and the angel to declare the prophecy of what the Lord intends to do. They always wait. 
they always did. They never said no unto God. And that's an illustration for you and for me. An example for you and for me. That whenever God sends, whatever God sends, whoever God sends us to, we declare the word and we're consistent to declare the word and the proclamation of the Lord. Already, you see, uh, Luke chapter 1, that's where the angel went to, uh, the, uh, to Zechariah. Now we're looking at Hebrews chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 2. Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 2, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received, it just recompense of reward. Then in verse 3 it says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? In Jude verse 1, those angels that were not consistent in doing the will of God and going to the place the Lord has sent them. And then they deviated and led their assignment and responsibility. Judge chapter 1 verse 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but led their own habitation. He has reserved in everlasting chains on the darkness unto the judgment of the great day. They gave us an example. If God is going to be happy with us as the servants of the Lord, as the ministers of the Lord, we should do what he has called us to do consistently. We will not have any excuse. I'm tired now. I'm weak now. I'm discouraged now. Every time we see the calling of the Lord and we plunge ourselves into the responsibility that the Lord has given us. And as they were consistent and they went in the strength of the Lord, excelling strength, we too will be consistent in serving the Lord and we minister in the strength, in the grace, in the power of the Spirit spirit that the Lord has given us. We're looking at number two here. Number two, consecrated ministers who do his pleasure. Look at Psalm 103 and we're reading from verse 21. Psalm 103 verse 21. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Do you ever think about that? That you'll not do what pleases you. You'll do what pleases him. Because every time are you leading us fellowship? Every time are you pastoring the local church? Every time are you overseeing a region? Are you overseeing a stage? Has God given you a particular responsibility? And that's why you are called a leader in the church. So you will do his pleasure. Temptations might come to do your own pleasure. The pool of the flesh might come to do your own pleasure. And something may enter into your head to do its own pleasure. If you're a real minister and a real leader that will please the Lord at all times, you'll say no. That's temptation. Yield not to temptation for yielding a sin. You want to do his pleasure at all times so you can remain a favored, faithful minister of the Lord every time. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, bless the Lord. All his works were his workmanship in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Look at some for, uh, Isaiah 44, reading from verse 28. Isaiah chapter 44, and we're reading from verse 28. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. 
that's God talking about somebody he has chosen and shall perform all my pleasure. He'll not please himself. I've known him. I've recognized him. I've chosen him. I've set him where he is. I've put him in place. He will not be a person that pleases himself. A person that pleases the highly placed. A person that pleases human beings around him. He will endeavor to perform all my pleasure. Even say to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. In Galatians chapter 1, reading from verse 10. Galatians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 10. For do I now persuade men, or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. There are people that have lost focus. They have lost courage. They have lost conviction. There's so much pressure of people around them. And those people put in pressure. They want to moderate what he preaches. They want to moderate where he preaches. They want to moderate what he does because they see that if he keeps on emphasizing the word of God, they are not willing to repent and not willing to turn around. Therefore, they want to put pressure on him, on her, to do their will. And they want to recondition them, to compromise. But you know, if you're a real child of God, a real minister of the gospel, you must understand that persecution comes with faithfulness. If you are faithful, there might be persecution. So you will not bend, you will not yield, and you will not turn around pleasing men. You will please the Lord every time. Why? Because the Lord is higher than all men put together. Why do you please the Lord all the time? Because He is the final judge, is the one that will evaluate what you have done, whether it be good or right, whether you are totally committed, consecrated to Him or not. And the suffering you might have now in this short time is nothing to be compared with the suffering of hell if you compromise and you don't get to heaven. That's why Paul the Apostle said, as for him, do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men if I yet pleased men? I should not be the servant of Christ. I pray that the consistency and the stamina and the steadfastness to keep on pleasing the Lord in doctrine, in decision, in dedication and in devotion to the Lord, that steadfastness the Lord will give us and continue to give us all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. Okay, he'll give me all the stamina, all the strength, all the steadfastness that I need that I journey on in Jesus' name. God bless you for that. Amen. Another amen will be all right. Number three now. Number three, confined mouths who deliver his precepts. What does that mean? Confined mouths. The mouths of the minister. That he says, I'm dedicating this mouth to this work. And I'm not going to use that same mouth for this other work. What does that mean? Is the hand that says, everything I write, everything I plan, Every project I pen is going to be for the Lord. I will not use my hand for God and then two days after for Satan or two days after for the projects of the world. I consecrate, I commit my mouth, my mind, 
my message, everything for the Lord. Confined mouths who deliver his precepts. Look at Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3. We're reading from verse 26. And I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth that thou shalt be done and shall not be to them a reprover for they are a rebellious house god was talking to ezekiel i've appointed you a watchman and i need your mouth all for me when i have a message i'll allow you to use that mouth when i don't have a message for the people i will shut your mouth up I will close your mouth. I confine your mouth to declaring just my words. Look at that again. I will make thy tongue, I, the Lord, will make your tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth, that thou shalt be dumb and shall not be to them a reprover, for they are a rebellious house. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, but when I speak with thee, when I have a message, when I'm sending you with that message to the children of Israel, when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, He that heareth, let him hear, and he that forbeareth, let him forbear, for they are a rebellious house the lord is telling us that our mouth our strength our skill our ability should be used for declaring his word now if you're a preacher and you know you are going to minister maybe in a crusade in the evening but during the day from morning until the time of preaching you are here and there you expend energy you talk you attend family meeting you attend the other kinds of meeting and then you are talking talking and talking and now at the time when you are now the, the to evangelize in the evening and to preach the evangelistic message you then come and then you take your bible you're not ready you're not suitable your mouth should be confined or maybe you are coming to the church and you are going to preach on Sunday and then in the car there is an issue that you have uh, not discussed at home with your wife or with your family and then they open it up and then you say no it's like this no it's not like that and then you almost uh, you know losing your temper and losing your cool and then you now get to the car park after that you say well anyway we'll continue later I will uh, you know, uh, give, give my part later, I'm not finished. And then you begin to you maybe come and teach out the scripture or you come and preach. It's flat. It's impotent. It doesn't have power. It doesn't have unction. You should know when to keep that mouth and then when to prepare yourself, how to prepare yourself for the great work you are going to do. And the Lord will make you effective in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three is the conscience and conscientiousness of models who served the Lord. We're looking at three things here. Number one, the exceptional flame, flame of fire of a convicting minister. Number two, the essential faultlessness of a conscientious messenger. Essential faultlessness. Number three, the exemplary faithfulness of a courageous Moses. Number one, the exceptional flame of a convicting minister. Look at Psalm 104, reading from verse 4. It says, Who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flaming fire? He maketh them 
a flame, a fire. He maketh them a flame of fire. Well, if the Lord has done that, when we speak, our words will not just be like insipid, not having any heat. There's no hotness there. And there's no pinching, there's no pungency there. It will prick the hearts of sinners who are there and drive them to conviction and repentance. Even the believers who are careless, if we have the flame of fire, it will convict them. It will make them to understand, I'm not where I ought to be. I need to move forward. And look at Psalm 106, verse 29. Thus, they provoked him to anger with their inventions. Talking about the children of Israel. And the plague break in upon them. And then Bastachi, in Bastachi, were told, then stood up Phinehas and executed judgment. And so the plague was staged. In Bastachi 1, it says, And that was counted unto him for righteousness unto all generations forever. What had happened is Balaam tried to curse the children of Israel, but he didn't succeed. And so he taught Balak to put his stumbling block before the children of Israel. And they went in, their men, unto the women of Moab. And they committed abominable practices with them. And there was one after the plague had broken out and many people were dying as a result of their sinning against the Lord. This other person now came with a immediate woman. And then as they were going, not minding the judgment that had come upon the nation because of the sin of immorality and abomination. And Phineas took a javelin. He was hot with fury against sin, against abomination. And then he dealt with them in the zeal of the Lord. That's what the Lord is referring to. He said, because he showed the flame of fire and the fury, that fierceness against sin, hot. Because of that flame, he said, I'll give him a reward. Look at Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 3. Acts chapter 2, verse 3. And there appeared unto them clubbing tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. They were baptized in the Holy Ghost. The promise was, ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And now the Holy Ghost came upon them and the fire of the Holy Ghost came upon them. And Peter who had been fearful, and Peter, who had denied the Lord 50 days before, now because of the fire of the Holy Ghost, he pointed at them, and he preached the word unto them. He said, you crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. They were preached in their heart. When we say we're filled and baptized and immersed in the Holy Ghost, our words, our messages, our declaration will bring conviction in the hearts of the people we're speaking to look at verse 36 in verse 36 therefore let all the house of israel know assuredly that god has made that same jesus whom ye have crucified both lord and christ verse 37 it says now when they had this they were preached in their their heart. He had the fire of the Holy Ghost. The Lord had made him a flaming fire in his preaching and declaration. And they were preached in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then verse 38, he told them, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized 
every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 41. In verse 41, it tells us, it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And those souls stayed. They remained. They didn't just say, well, we gave our life to Jesus, but we are not going to continue. The word had penetrated them, pinched them down, and they came to the Lord, and they remained with the Lord. We're looking at number two. Number two, the essential faultlessness of a conscientious messenger. Look at Psalm 105. We're reading from verse 17. Psalm 105, verse 17. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, talking about this Joseph to bind his princess at his pleasure and to teach his senators wisdom. You know the life of that, of that Joseph when he was in Potiphar's house and when he was in the prison and when he came before a pharaoh, everything he did, you couldn't find a fault. In Genesis chapter 39, reading from verse 9, Genesis chapter 39, reading from verse 9, there is none greater in this house than I, neither has he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You know his story, he will not do evil. And the people who say they're serving God today, and we say we're servants of the Lord, and we're ministers of the gospel, the same faultlessness, freedom from sin, is required from you and I, from everyone. Revelation chapter 14, reading from verse 4. Revelation chapter 14, we're reading from verse 4, and it says, these are they which are not defiled with women. Amen. For they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruit unto God and to the Lamb. Look at verse 5. It says, And in their mouth was found no guile, no deception, no lying, no hypocrisy. No duplicity. And it says, For they are without fault before the throne of God. The Lord who gave Joseph and Enoch and Samuel and Daniel and all those worthies of old and Paul and Peter and the rest of them who gave them a life without fault, a life without continual sinning, that same grace is available, it will grant unto you, unto me, unto us in Jesus' name. Jude chapter 1, reading from verse 20. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Verse 24, in verse 24, it tells us now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. It says in verse 25, to him, the only wise God, our Savior, the glory and majesty and dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Amen. Point number three now is the exemplary faithfulness of a courageous Moses. It tells us in Psalm 106, reading from verse 16, 
they envied Moses also in the camp and Aaron the saint of the Lord we've learned about all these leaders and you know very much about Moses how by faith he endured how by faith he did everything he did as if he was seeing the invisible and they were told he was faithful he was faithful and the Lord make everyone every one of us faithful in Jesus name numbers chapter 12 verse 7 in numbers chapter 12 verse, verse 7 my servant Moses is not so who is faithful in all mine house that God will have the same testimony concerning you you will be faithful I said you will be faithful I will be faithful the Lord will grant you all the grace you need to remain faithful unto the end in Jesus name Revelation chapter 17 verse 14 Revelation chapter 17 verse 14 these shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them our savior will overcome them every enemy he will overcome every opposer to the ministry the lord has put us in the lamb will overcome all opposition in jesus name for he is lord of lords and king of kings and they that are with him are called are you called and chosen are you chosen and faithful called and chosen and faithful how i pray that god will help every one of us to re-examine our lives and then to plunge into the blood of the Lamb that washes and cleanses and makes whiter than snow that in little things, in temporary things, in big things, in great things, in things of eternal value, in everything small and great, we remain faithful in Jesus' name. When we are with men privately, with women privately, or in the public when we're ministering when we're praying and when we're doing anything whether church members are there or not whether our followers are there or not whether other people that can evaluate what we're doing whether they're there or not will remain faithful in the congregation will be faithful in the church will be faithful in the family will be faithful and in ministry everything the lord has taught us and has told us to go and give to the people will be as faithful as moses or even more faithful in jesus name are you there we ask for grace to be faithful why don't you stand up and tell the lord and say lord help me all that have learned today lord help me it's called us it's commissioned us to serve the lord open your mouth and tell the lord what we have heard we cannot obey except we have the grace of god what we have heard we cannot carry out except we have the strength and the might of the lord Tell the Lord, recognize your calling. Recognize the commission that the Lord himself has given you. And then you are telling the Lord, I want to take that calling, I want to take that commission seriously and pursue with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, I want to recognize that serving the Lord is a commandment, is a commission. Open your mouth and tell the Lord, are you a pastor? Recognize the calling, recognize the commission, and recognize the great commission he has given you. Lord, I will.
sink in all you have your talent your skill your ability your commitment give it the first place in your heart in your life The command to minister and to serve the Lord. A commandment is to be obeyed. And when we do not obey the command, we sin. And if we're living in disobedience to the command of the Lord, the command to serve, and the command to minister, and a command to serve the Lord with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. If we're not giving everything we have into the service of the Lord, it's a disobedience against the commandment of the Lord. Tell the Lord to wake you up. Wake up your conscience. Stir you up. And say, Lord, I've heard again, I'll be faithful. I've heard again, I'll be diligent. I've heard again, I will recommit myself to the calling that you have given me. I'll have the attitude of absolute surrender. Remember the character of the minister and a consistency in that character. Like the psalmist said, I will behave myself in a perfect way. My behavior will align with the commandments and the words of God. Tell the Lord, the language of my mouth, the action of my hand, the oppression of my gifts, the things that I do, I will behave myself in a perfect way. I will not set a wicked thing before my mind, before my eyes. Whether other people see me or not, whether they know me or not, my faithfulness and my obedience to your word is going to be transparent because I know you see me every time. And remember the cost of mercenaries, the people who are just there, they are not fulfilling the purpose of God, the purpose of Christ, the purpose of the gospel, the purpose of bringing souls into the kingdom the purpose of making sinners repent, the purpose of making backsliders to be restored, and the purpose of making saints, the children of God, to be steadfast. They are not into that. They're mercenaries. The cost of having a can in the team, and the cost of having Judas as carriot in the team. Tell the Lord, I'll be a real disciple. I'll be a submissive disciple. I'll be a yielded disciple. I'll be a disciplined disciple. I'll not allow the works of the flesh to have an abominable influence over my life. Sage, walking aright, sanctified, living in transparent holiness. Help me, Lord. I'll not be a deceiver. 
I'll not be a hypocrite. I'll not be Judas Iscariot. I'll not be a backslider. Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. Re examine your consecration. Re examine your consistency in laying everything on the altar. Is your consecration today higher than the consecration of 20, 30, 25 years ago? Are you consistent in serving the Lord above birth? Righteous consistently, sincere consistently, submissive to the Lord and to leadership consistently, appreciating the truth you're learning consistently, and walking in the light, living in the light, abiding in the light consistently. Do you remind yourself of the words you are hearing consistently and live by that word, not allowing any moment to be lost and not allowing the message to be lost on your life? Consecrated ministers that do his pleasure. Are you doing the pleasure of the Lord? Are you there to do your own pleasure? Your own will? Your own likings? Are you saying, Lord, I recommit myself, I reconsecrate my heart, my life, my service? to every judge and every title of your word to do your pleasure to abide in your pleasure to appreciate your pleasure if you pray and mean it he give you the consecration the strength, the steadfastness, the solid commitment, and the word of God will come to your remembrance every time that you will do His pleasure, fulfill His will at all times and your mouth will be confined to just his message his ministry you will not give your mouth to this to this to that contradictory things feel the things abominable things but your mouth be consistently committed to declaring his truth and delivering his precepts. And you'll minister with conscience and conscientiousness with zeal what passion your whole heart will be there your whole mind will be there and the Lord will approve of the way you give yourself 
conscientiously to the service of the Lord. You remember those examples we have? Joseph, faithful, faultless. How can I do this and sin against my God? You'll be conscious of holiness every time. And you'll make her, you'll make him, whoever is the object of temptation, be conscious of holiness. I cannot do that. I cannot hold that. I cannot touch that. I cannot move in that way. I cannot give myself my time to that. Faultless. And you'll be like a flame of fire. The fire of the Holy Ghost will be evident in your ministry. And when you speak to sinners, a fiery conviction will be upon them. They'll be asking, what will I do? That I will be saved. And you'll stir up believers to move on, to move higher. You'll stir up believers so that their heart will punch after the nature of God. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You'll be panting after that yourself, and you lead others to pant after that too. And like Phinehas, you deal with sin, provided you are not a sinner yourself. And you deal with filthiness that is trying to penetrate into the assembly of the children of God. There will be fire in your heart, passion in your heart, fire in your bones. You will not be a compromiser for sin, with evil, with iniquity. And as Moses by faith remained faithful, so you'll be faithful in little things, in big things, in temporal things, in eternal things, faithful to the gospel, faithful in godliness. You'll be an example yourself to other people. An example of faultlessness. An example of fiery ministry. Like a flame of fire. An example of faultlessness and faithfulness. The Lord confirm it in every life in Jesus' name. Amen. And the Lord make every one of us consistent, Amen. consecrated, Amen. committed, Amen. and conscientious in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for what we have learned today. Thank you for the calling you have given us. Thank you for the commission you have given us. We pray, Lord, our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength, and focus will remain on this commission without looking back in Jesus' name. Remind us of the calling every time. 
when temptation comes to be tired, to be discouraged, to give up and to step back, Lord, we pray your spirit will remind us of that great commission and will keep on moving on in Jesus' name. And we're asking, Lord, the commitment you expect and the consecration you expect and the consistency you expect from a faithful minister you will have from every one of us in Jesus name we're asking the Lord as we serve you will bring honesty into the service heart into the service yieldedness into the service will not be half-hearted or hypocritical in the way we're serving you in Jesus' name. Lord, as your messengers will be consistent, as your messengers will be committed, as your messengers will be conscientious in everything in Jesus' name. We pray that your spirit will come upon us afresh and the fire and the power of the Holy Ghost will take over every one of our lives in Jesus' name. You promise that you'll make all your ministers a flame of fire. We pray, Lord, that fiery disposition like Elijah like fiery disposition like john the baptist and that fiery disposition to deal with sin and smart sin and cross sin like phineas grant to everyone in jesus name and lord the faultlessness and the sinlessness and the freedom and the victory over sin, small sin, great sin, open sin, private sin, habitual sin, whatever sin, that kind of life you gave unto Joseph that he said, I will not sin. That determination, that discipleship, that discipline, give to every one of us in Jesus' name. And the faithfulness you granted unto Moses, even though his own senior brother of the same parents compromised, even though Miriam sometimes also gossiped, even though the children of Israel, even though they compromised and went away and still stood as a figure that will not compromise any time, that uncompromising, unyielding, unbending spirit, Grant to everyone in Jesus' name. And so, as we are uncompromising and standing, we'll be able to inter intercede appropriately for those who have gone astray. And then you'll be able to testify, like you testified of Moses. Moses, my servant, is not so. He is faithful in all my house. You'll be able to testify about every one of us in Jesus' name. And this work of the Lord will keep on doing it without going back, without looking back, without uh, compromising, without any discouragement. And your fire will keep on burning on the altar of every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. We pray, we'll not hear and forget will not hear and toss it aside as we have heard will remember as we have heard it will be a fruit in our lives and we'll pray like worthy of old like that joseph like that phineas like that moses you'll make every one of us and when the trumpet shall sound we'll receive reward from you in jesus name we we'll thank you lord because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray Thank you and God bless everyone.